I wanted to begin, because we're talking about hope at Christmas time, I wanted to begin with a story. It comes from James Dobson, and they're focused on the family ministry. And it's a story that came into their ministry, and I wanted to share it with you. It's uh, about a woman, an uh, elderly woman, Stella Thornhope, and Stella was facing her first Christmas uh, for a lot of years without her husband. Uh, he had had a slow developing cancer, had uh, passed away a few weeks before Christmas, and she was at home uh, by herself. A severe storm, winter storm came through. I think you can relate to a little of the severity part, maybe, and uh, she was all alone, and it was cold and fairly miserable outside, and she was in that house by herself, and she felt the, the weight of it, and she felt the loneliness of it. She had just settled in and sat down in a comfortable chair and turned on a radio to listen to a few Christmas songs. And she wasn't expecting anyone, but the doorbell rang. So as uh, the story goes, she went to the door and there was a delivery boy at the door with a box. And he said, uh, ma'am, this is for you. I need you to sign for it. And uh, she invited him on in because that open door was cooling the house down rapidly. He came in, as she's signing, she says, uh, what is it? And he smiled and said, well, I'll just show you. And he, he opened a flap of the box to reveal uh, a fur ball of a golden Labrador retriever puppy. He said, uh, puppy's six weeks old, it's uh, housebroken, you ought to be good to go, and, uh, oh, and here, here's a book, How to Care for Your Labrador Retriever, and he turned to go, and she said, but, but who's the, who's it from? And she said, uh, the, the young man told her, well, it's from your husband. Uh, he made all these arrangements uh, a while back. Uh, Merry Christmas. And he handed her an envelope and he said, this, this explains more. So she opened it up. It was a letter from her husband. He had, he had written the letter three weeks before he died and had taken it to the kennel where the puppy was going to be coming from and made sure they were delivered together. And she opened the letter and it was all the things that uh, she certainly needed for that day. Just words of love and encouragement. Tell her to you know, hang in there and that... I wanted to do something, and I wanted to give you one last Christmas present, and so if this puppy is for you, one of these days, I look forward to the day when we're reunited. They're both strong believers in Christ. One of these days, we'll be reunited in heaven, but I wanted you to have this, this gift to just take care of you till we can be together again. She hadn't planned to decorate for Christmas. She was... And overwhelmed by her loneliness. She then realized the puppy's on the floor somewhere. She found the puppy, picked it up, held it close. As she looked I don't know, across the street through her open her front window, she saw Christmas lights across the way. And she looked at the puppy and she said, little fellow, uh, it's just you and me. But I tell you what. There are a couple of boxes down in the basement that I think you'd be interested in. We've got a little Christmas tree, and we have some uh, decorations, and we have some lights, and we have a little manger scene. And uh, you and I are going to go get them, and we're going to set them up. Because we're going to do Christmas together. Now, God just has a way... Of sometimes sending a signal with a little bit of light. And some of you came in and for any number of reasons things feel a little dark to you today. But God has a way of sending a message of light. And to remind us that life is stronger than death. And light is more powerful than darkness. And God is more powerful than Satan. And good will overcome evil. And all our hopes, all our hopes 
are in a Savior who has come and is coming again. And just know, he still holds the whole world in his hands. We're here to celebrate the Savior today and the hope that is ours in him. I wonder what it would be like to be born in a manger. Yeah. I wonder whatever happened to baby Jesus. He, he grew up. What? Wait. So you're saying that the baby Jesus Christmas story is the same as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. Thanks, honey. Wow, I just never really put the two concepts together. <laughs> Wonder what happened to that guy, huh? <laughs> he... he went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. So what you're saying is baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus? Yeah. I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he... he grew up, he taught people, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and came back to life, and, you know, now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts? <sighs> okay, I was really, oh, wow. Okay, I never really put all those guys together, you know? Only one guy. I tell you this. Here's an idea. Maybe we stop just making Christmas all just this once a year isolated thing, but we make it an ongoing story about the salvation in our hearts and lives. Up top. That's the idea. Maybe not quite so extreme, but a whole lot of people, I think, disconnect the Christmas story from the broader story, and we want to move on to the broader story, not just that Jesus came as uh, glorious as God entering the world is to our story, but that he came to be the Savior of the world, and what does that mean for us? And one of the things it most definitely means, it means we have hope. Now, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 32, let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Today, I want to talk about one of the difficult tensions that we have in, in life. And as followers of Christ, one of the difficult tensions. And it's something we have to manage. How do you remain hopeful in a hopelessly broken world? And the world is hopelessly broken. How, how do you continue to, to function well when things are not well in you and around you. If, if you've ever had something you placed your hope in that just came crashing down, you understand the dilemma. Uh, some people put their hopes in a marriage or a career or wealth or health or an engagement or an academic uh, achievement or an athletic achievement. And then it all unravels, it all falls apart. That source of our hope disappoints. And, and when that happens, you start thinking, oh, why even try? What's the use? What's the point? I want to share a couple of introductory thoughts. The first one is hope. Hope, a person or thing in which my expectations are centered. The person or thing in which you have placed your confidence in relationship to your future. Hopelessness, hopelessness, the feeling that comes with knowing that the person or thing in which I have placed my hope will not or cannot come through. From the day we're born, we place our hope somewhere in someone or something. Early on in life, it's in our, usually in our parents. Along the way, we transfer our hope focus to other places, to other things, to other people. 
And along the way, we transfer regularly because the places where we lean the ladder of our hopes fall short, disappoint us. Oh, we trust it to support our dreams, our security, our future. And we don't think about it much until, until it falls apart, until it unravels, until it goes away. And then it, it, it's like uh, our hope dissipates and we find ourselves gasping for hope like we would gasp for air when it was not available to us. And we, we come to feel hopeless and helpless and powerless. Now, the older we get, the more prone we are to pick our objects of hope as things that we can control and we can manage. We can, uh, we do a lot of hope management. We place our hopes in people. We place our hope in things that promise us maybe relational, financial security. One of the things that drives a lot of depression in lives is an overwhelming sense of hopelessness because those relational areas, those financial areas where we've leaned the ladder of our hopes has come up short. Throughout the pages of Scripture, we're told, put your hope in God. In my Bible reading today, uh, I was reading in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. And in seemingly hopeless situations, when things seem so dark, the people are reminded over and over, place your hope in God. And they place their hope in maybe Egypt will come and rescue us. They place their hopes in maybe our walls in Jerusalem will protect us. They place their hopes in all sorts of things except, except in God. And we, we tend to do the same now, the thing we need to understand when it comes to hope, and we're not good at this as a nation, we're not good at this in our first world culture, is we try to choose other sources of hope because we really think that, that we, can, we can manage our troubles. We're not convinced that our world is so broken that it can't just be tweaked a little, adjusted here and there, uh, whitewashed to look better on the outside and everything will be fine. We believe we can do this ourselves. And we, we're rich young rulers here in North Texas to a large extent. We're fairly well to do. We have a lot of security. We have a lot of safety net under us. And so we think, well, through exercise, through investments, through medication, surgery, relationships, education. We can get ourselves in a place where we're just untouchable. And nothing is going to rock our lives. And then we go about spending the rest of our life, once we've leaned the ladder of our hopes against something lesser than God, we spend the rest of our lives trying to shore up and reinforce that ladder to make sure it stays there. But our world is broken, and it's more broken than we know. Here's why it's so broken. And we're going to look at the book of Romans today. And I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Uh, there's so much in Romans, and it's a powerful book, and it reaches so deep and so far. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the little biographies of Jesus, the book of Acts, the history book of the New Testament. The book of Romans is the first in order of the letters of the Apostle Paul. And Romans chapter 8 oh, is a high water mark in Scripture. So what you find in the book of Romans from the, from the last half of the first chapter till oh, around chapter 3, verse 20... Paul is developing a doctrine of sin. This is what sin is. This is what sin does. And this is what sin does in relationship to him. It separates us from him. It breaks the relationship, distances us from God in ways we cannot repair ourselves. From Romans 3.21 through Romans 8, Paul tells us, this is what I've done to take care of sin. 
This is what God has done to make this right. This is what God has done to build a bridge we could not build to God. He sent his sinless son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die on a cross, to send his son. The Christmas story isn't where it stops. He sent him for a purpose, to die on a cross as the sinless son of God, that he might pay for our sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is our hope. And I don't know where you're trying to place your hopes today. We, we give lip service to God's our hope. And then we, we go about actually placing it in reality everywhere but in Him. He and He alone is our hope. The Bible addresses this head on in lots of places. But Romans 8 is such a powerful chapter. Paul gives us some valuable insight. Now you think about this. He's writing to Christians in Rome under the reign of a crazed uh, Emperor Nero. And they're a cultural minority and they're a religious minority. And they are oppressed, pushed on every side, uh, marginalized in their society. And they're starved for hope. And that's why this chapter is so special to me. And what I'd like to do today is... And we're not going to, you could spend, uh, we could spend weeks and weeks in a sermon series just on the 8th chapter of Romans. Uh, in years past, I've spent six, uh, seven, seven consecutive Sundays just in the 8th chapter of Romans. Today, I want to share some things that are just special to me from the 8th chapter of Romans in relationship to my hope. And, and what, I'm, what I'm drawing from, uh, this isn't the beginning and end of everything you could draw out of the 8th chapter of Romans, but this is something that just comes out of my prayer notebook, some things that I go back and revisit from time to time. I want to be reminded of, and especially when things are difficult, when hope feels, seems, seems, feels hard to come by. These are things I revisit, and maybe you would hang on to this to take it out, to review it. Maybe there's someone that you just know needs to hear a word of hope in this season. Here's the first thing. I have hope because, I have hope because my sins are forgiven and my eternity is secured. Really, if there was nothing else, that's all the hope we need. My sins are forgiven, my eternity is secured. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This is such good news. It is such good news that God, God has paid the price because of what Jesus did at the cross. Because he is raised, you are declared not guilty, justified before God. By grace, he offers this through faith in him. It's available to you. And this is good news. And it is hope. When most of our world is lost in darkness, separated from God for time and eternity, and without hope, you have hope through Jesus Christ. Am I the only one that thinks that's good news? Amen. I am the only one? Is that what the amen means? I know the context is a little complicated there. No, it's good news. There are things to celebrate in the 8th chapter of Romans. I have hope, second, because... The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to me. I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 11. <laughs> I love this truth. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Oh my goodness. The same power that overcame death, that raised Jesus from the dead, is available to you, resides in you. What are you facing today? You, you think you're coming up a little short in the, in, in the power category? The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you. How incredible is that? that? That is something to celebrate because it is a great source of hope. Third, I have hope because I'm a child of God and an heir of His kingdom. Verse 15. For you did not, why don't you put your name in there? For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. You are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, a member of His family. Everybody is His creation. But to become a member of His family... He reaches out to us with that spirit of adoption. He wants us in his family. He has chosen us. We respond to this act of grace by faith. Yes, I want to be a part of your family. And then we are heirs. Your inheritance, uh, all that is eternal and glorious. Fourth, I have hope because my future victory is greater than... My present pain. Verse 18. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What what are you going through? And how heavy does it feel? And how deep is the hurt? And some of you, it feels heavy. And the hurt is deep today. And I know a lot of your stories. And... This part gives me great encouragement personally, and it gives me great hope. Whatever I face, no matter how difficult it is, if you step back and you say, okay, I'm going to live on this earth for these decades, but because of my relationship to Jesus Christ, I will live with Him forever and ever in an eternity that so overwhelms here and these decades with the glorious presence of God in the glorious Eternity he is preparing in heaven for me. I have great hope that it so outweighs the present. I can manage the present. I can live with the present. I, cannot, I will not have to be overwhelmed by the present. And it does not steal away my hope because of the future prepared for me. Fifth, I have hope because God helps me in my weakness. Verse 26 says... Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray, uh, pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I, ha- I have personal prayer requests, and I have prayer requests for other prayers that, that I, I intercede, I pray for other people. And I have lists and I have burdens that I carry in prayer. And so do you. So much of our praying is letting God know what he ought to be doing. We're telling God, here's your marching orders for today. You know what would make my life a lot better, in my opinion? If you do A, B, and C. If, if you just take care of that, you get all fixed. Because nobody knows better how the world ought to run and how my life ought to run than me, right? Not so much. And the more time I spend in prayer, the more I realize how inadequate my vision is for the world and for me. And I spend a little more time now than I did in years past and earlier in my Christian walk. I spend a lot more time now saying, God, here's this situation. And I know I know how what my will would be for it, but. It's not my will, it's your will be done. I think that's how Jesus uh, modeled prayer. So God, I I don't know how it should work, but I know that you're working in it, so would you do that thing that you do in a way that that shows your, your hand at work in it? And I trust that the Holy Spirit intercedes for me in the details of that in ways that are right on target, exactly. Uh... What needs to take place. And uh, he says uh, in that verse. In our weakness. Oh my. I, I thought I was a lot better at things. And a lot stronger in things. And a lot more capable at things. When uh, I wasn't uh, quite as experienced in things as I am today. But I found uh, my list of weaknesses is an ever growing list. And I need The strength of the Lord. And he has proven himself faithful over and over and over again. He is my strength and he is my hope. Sixth, 
I, I have hope because God's working everything in my life for good. Verse 28, maybe one of the verses that more of you are aware of in the 8th chapter. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. It doesn't say everything that happens is good. It doesn't say everything will work out good for everybody. It says it's going to work out for the good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. But my hope, my hope is this, that God is not going to waste anything in my life. Now I can look back at this point in my life, my Christian pilgrimage, and I can see, I never imagined he'd be able to redeem that situation. I never imagined he could take something that seems so broken in this experience, and he could make it so eternally good. And I have plenty of things that are around me right now and plenty of things I see in the future that are so cloudy for me and so dark for me. But what I've learned is that God never wastes anything. He never wastes. We, we say there's, this is a tragedy and we experience tragedy in life. But God does not waste tragedy in the life of a believer. We go through pain and we go through difficulty and separation and heartache. But God doesn't waste those things. He turns those things and uses those things and, and, and grows those things for our good and for His glory. Always for our good and for His glory. Seventh, I have hope because God's for me. And who can be against me? And that's, that's what verse 31 says. What then should we say to these things? If God, and this, by the way, he's answering the question, this is what you should say. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, if God is for me, who can be against me? How is God for us? Well, verse 32 says, because I, I hear comments that say, God let me down. God forgot me. God failed me. God has left me uh, sitting on the roadside. How could he have possibly ever let this take place? He must not really love me. But he says, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If you ever, if you ever get to a spot where you doubt, does God really care about me? Does God love me? He gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him not perish but have eternal life. But he went to the... Came, that beautiful little manger scene is because Jesus could go to the cross as the sinless son of God and pay for our sin. He didn't hold that back from us. He's not holding all. He's not holding back his love and his grace and his power and his presence. All those things are ours. He is for us. And he cares. And you need never give up hope. I have hope. I have hope because nothing can separate me from the love of God. Verse 35, uh, Paul asks the question, Who shall separate us from the love of God? And he runs through a laundry list in that verse of uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Can any of those things separate us from the love of God? Because we, we seem to think he can. Well, God just doesn't love me because it didn't all work out the way I wanted it to. God doesn't love me because my life isn't always carefree, easy, up and to the right on the uh, scale of things. But the Bible says, in all these frustrating things, in all these things that weigh on us, in all these burdens of life, in all these crises and tragedies, it still goes back, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then, oh, a big finish. No, verse 37 says, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And then Paul, verse 38, he, there's a lot of theology in Romans. Verse 38 is just personal testimony. And this personal testimony is powerful. For I am sure... Some of your translations say, I am convinced. I, I, have, I have information from experience. 
I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. There's a good blanket term to cover anything else that's on your list. Nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where's your hope? Why don't you move the ladder of your hopes to the great wall of God's love? Love, not demonstrated in the, well, does God love me? Well, let's see. Did I get the job? Did I get the promotion? Did uh, I get the scholarship? Did I marry into money? Did I earn the position on the team? No, love demonstrated in history for eternity that his son, Jesus the Christ died on the cross for your sin to secure for you a place in his family. Now, these are great truths and they are encouraging things to me. However, like you, I have days when, you know the phrase, in the meantime? Do you know I live my life in the meantime? You ever have that feeling? I live between here and there. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in the in-between time, between the glorious that awaits and the promises that will be completely fulfilled in the future, and then everything that we go through just now, in this world, in all of its brokenness, what do you do? Well, you live out kingdom of God life and kingdom of God values and you stay true to what he said to be, what he said to do, and how he said to do it. You, you stay true to those things. And, and we live in a world of unhappy endings. I mean, we're, we're all... Statistical information is always helpful. And as we've said before many times, do you know what the death rate in the United States is? It's 100%. We're all dying. If Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, we're all going to, we're, we're all terminal. And we live out kingdom values in a world of unhappy endings, but we see Jesus doing that. Did Jesus ever get criticized? Did Jesus ever be, was he ever attacked? Good, he went all the way to the cross and died a brutal death on the cross at the hands of evil people. That, this is, that, this is the road Jesus followed. And it seemed like an unhappy ending. But then there's a resurrection. Because that's how God does things often. Uh, Paul, he lived a faithful life, true to God's calling, true to this life in Christ. Knowing that suffering to the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that we reveal to us. He knew all those things. And yet there are Plenty of days when he probably didn't just jump up and down and cheer about it. They're hard days. But he lived faithfully the life of unhappy endings. That was true for all these heroes of the Bible. They all lived this life a struggle sometimes, difficulties, problems arise, and yet they are hope-filled people. Many of us have relationships with people we have known who've gone through great crisis, great tragedy, great difficulty, and we see their lives and we see how they did it. And they see the faithfulness that they demonstrated in the journey and continue to demonstrate in the journey. And we say, thank you, God, for the encouragement of testimony of other believers who have done this before me, are doing this around me, and I have hope. So you continue to love other people because people need to be loved, and you continue to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you continue to care and you continue to serve. And, and this is not a, a fatalism. I don't want you to feel that ever. I don't want you to feel like, oh, I'm a Christian, so I'm just here to be knocked around. That's, that's my responsibility as a Christ follower. Well, no, you, you, you seek. It doesn't mean you don't have godly ambition. It doesn't mean that you don't seek to become. It doesn't mean you don't seek to achieve to progress, to dream godly dreams. But here's the difference. We don't put our hopes in our plans 
and our dreams and our accomplishments, our ambitions. We, we have those things, but instead of grasping onto them as our hope, we hold all those things, but with an open hand that they don't control us, they don't direct us, they don't drive us. And as you hold your, your hopes, your dreams, your ambitions, your treasures with an open hand, those things stop holding on to you quite so tight, uh, wrapped, uh, hands wrapped around your heart. And we're able to, to more faithfully move our ladder of hope to the Lord our God, who is the only source of hope. What I want you to invite you to do today is to evaluate where are my hopes today and where do I need to invest my hope. The psalmist we began with, again, said, let your unfailing love surround us. Lord, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Where are your hopes today? Where are you investing today? Where are you leaning the ladder of, of, your, of your time in eternity today? I'll tell you something. A lot of folks have heard plenty of messages about Christmas story. And they've heard plenty of lessons about Easter story. And they've heard Jesus stories and Noah and the Ark stories and David and Goliath stories and all that's familiar territory and, and yet there's never been a transaction that took place when as God by grace offers up relationship to him that's real and personal and transformational forever. They never responded to that gift. They know about it. They've heard it. They think it's a good thing. Goodness, people have been in church forever and ever. And, and, and we will put our hopes in, well, I said a prayer once with some pastor, so I must be good. I was baptized in some church, so I must be good. I was confirmed in some ceremony, so it must be, I must be squared away. It's so much more than, than that, to have a relationship to God. It, it's to... It's a heart thing that is more than a religious activity and more than, more than just a saying the right words in a prayer. It's, it's you and God and this relationship being made right through Jesus. And one of the great burdens of my heart is people who, who have heard the stories over and over again. And, and yet, it's just never gotten to hear. It's never become really personal. It's never become, it's never become salvation. And I want you to know this. I want you to know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. I want you to know that you have a relationship with God that will buoy you in the storms of life and give you hope that is an unfailing, unending hope. And that you can, you can know that there's an eternity waiting for you that far outweighs anything you face here.